If you're sick of making the exact same stir fry week after week, you have come to the right place. I was like you not that long ago, making the same stir fry with the same flavors and the same techniques, and I was sick of it. I was tired. I was bored. It was time for a change. So I went into some serious stir fry research and development mode for the last few weeks, and today I will be sharing with you my findings. I've got three recipes from three different countries that all have their own unique techniques and delicious flavors, but most importantly, they're all simple enough to be whipped up for a nice easy weeknight meal. All right, let's start things off strong. Our very first stir fry, we're headed over to Thailand, which is a cuisine that has a lot of Chinese influence. And with that comes a lot of stir fries, of course. And this is the classic Thai vegetable stir fry. I'm stealing this specific recipe from Andy Ricker's cookbook, which is one of my favorites for Thai cuisine, trusted and approved over the years. I did have Derek send over a voice note pronouncing this dish. <laughs> Meat. Pak pak rua meat. And this is a dish that takes what should be just like a boring vegetable stir fry to a completely new stratosphere through just incredible techniques and delicious flavors. I've got all of my veggies here, my condiments that I'm gonna be using. But the first thing we need to do is just get a pot of water boiling because we blanch all of the veggies before we stir fry. Now, what I love about this dish is that it's all technique, it's all flavor. The veggies you use can really be anything. So these are sort of inspired by the cookbook recipe with some slight alterations. And I'm just peeling this carrot first. And this might sound crazy, but since this dish is so simple, small little things like the way you cut the vegetables makes a big difference. From what I've found over testing it a few times. So I'm gonna slice the carrots in half and then just kind of slice them on this bias. Nice bite-sized chunks that will cook evenly. Slice through this baby. Carrots done and we'll just pile everything up here. I've got some snow peas, and these will actually go in whole. I've got some king oyster mushrooms, which is in the actual recipe, but you could definitely use other mushrooms for this. I'll cut them similar to the carrot. Just slice right through. A little bit of onion. Probably just need a little piece of this. It's about a third of the onion. I'll do some thinner slices here. And finally, I have some savoy cabbage. You could use Napa, you could use green cabbage. I've just sliced around the core, and then I'll just section this up. Just sort of nice chunks like this. So here you go, veggies prepped. And I think the key right here, you gotta just experiment with sizes and shapes because everything does kind of cook together at the same time. And we want these vegetables at the end to be tender, but also have a nice crunch. And it comes down to the size. And we are ready to go over here for some blanchy. I don't know how I'm gonna do this with one hand. Oh boy, this is a terrible idea. You know what? You're gonna get a nice little POV right into the pot. Come on. I think this is working. Zaba. You do not wanna skip this step, in my opinion. A lot of recipes will go straight to the stir fry, but the blanching, I think, is the key. And this will be just one minute in the water. And in the meantime, definitely turn on our wok. Be ready to go there. We gotta cut up some aromatics, which is really simple. A lot of garlic, that's the key to this dish. I'm gonna do four cloves. Spice is actually optional. I don't even know if Andy Ricker has it in his recipe, but I've got this jalapeno lying around. It seems tempting. We'll do a little spice. And since I'm not prepped, I gotta really plow through this stuff. Before those veggies, have to come out. How quick can I mince garlic? I'm just gonna rattle through this. Ah! That's pretty damn rough, but good in my book. All right, one minute up here. I'll just dig these out. You can see they still beautiful color. It's gonna preserve all that freshness, all of that texture. I'm telling you, this blanching technique is kind of what makes the dish, in my opinion. And I will just get that under some cold water to retain that crispiness. Boom, all of our veggies. All right, back to the jalapeno. Just a little bit of that. And we'll rattle through this jalapeno. On aromatics. Stir fry time. All right, we're gonna get some oil in the pan, just some neutral oil. Good bit of that, that's your only fat. And then we'll just get this garlic and chili starting to stir fry. And whenever you have garlic in there, I tend to not go super high heat because it will burn so fast. So just a nice sizzle, sizzle. Already smells incredible. Let's make a quick stir fry sauce. This is really simple. My recommendation, if you're trying to just up your stir fry experience, go to your local Asian market. I went to H Mart last week and I just completely 
completely restocked. It had been a while. I needed some fresh flavors in my life. So I picked out a bunch of different condiments that sort of span multiple Asian cuisines. And if you're doing this for the first time, think about balancing a sauce. You definitely want salty and umami. So maybe some different types of soy sauces, fish sauce, especially for Thai cuisine like this, some fermented miso or bean paste, and oyster sauce is really gonna span multiple cuisines. You definitely want those acidic notes. So having different types of vinegars, like a black vinegar or rice wine vinegar, or different types of cooking alcohols, like Chinese cooking wine or sake for Japanese cuisine, which you'll see coming up. You can always throw in some aromatic oils, like a sesame oil or a chili paste for a little bit of spice. This vegetable stir fry has some thin soy sauce. You can use regular soy sauce, oyster sauce, fish sauce, and a little bit of sugar. I'm actually using this fermented garlic honey. But since these are browning already, I'm just gonna dump off these vegetables and get these stir frying in there. Booyah! We'll crank the heat up now that the garlic's protected. Now all of those aromatic oils are infusing in those vegetables. And once that water cooks off a bit, we're gonna be stir frying. And this basic Thai stir fry sauce is so simple. Half of it is gonna be oyster sauce. So we'll do two big heaping tablespoons of that. Pour some more umami and saltiness. One tablespoon of fish sauce. And then even more salty. One tablespoon of thin soy sauce. And it needs that salt because the vegetables are blanched and bland right now. And then the recipe calls for one teaspoon of sugar. I'm just using this fermented garlic honey. Stir that up. There's your stir fry sauce. Mm. You know you're in good shape when the stir fry sauce tastes good just out of the spoon. We're still cooking off a little bit of that water, but I can hear those oil pops, which is a good sign. We're gonna add in this stir fry sauce and just coat the hell out of it. It's so simple, it's so fresh. So we'll stir fry that for like 30 seconds on high heat. And in Thai cuisine, you don't see as much cornstarch like you would see in Chinese cuisine to really thicken things up. They keep the sauce more thin. So I have a little bit of chicken stock and I like adding this after that initial stir fry of those more intense elements. And this will thin things out. So you have more of a sauce to eat with your rice. See that sauce? I just wanna taste that real quick. So good. All right, so we're gonna take that off the heat. I'm bringing on this small pan on high heat. That's all vegetables. You can keep it nice and simple like that. In the recipe, Andy Ricker uses shrimp, so it's super customizable. What I'm gonna do is one of my favorite techniques I learned from Derek for a Thai crispy egg. So I just get this thing ripping hot. That was probably not hot enough. <laughs> it's all right. And I'll crack in four eggs or whatever will fill your pan and just let that bubble away. We'll hit it with a little pat, little salt. You want a good nonstick for this. I'm using my hex clad. I believe this is an eight inch pan. Look at that, crispy, but not sticking. Spin, 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 spin. Very careful here for the flip. Wow, that is like a glass egg. We don't wanna completely cook through everything just so those eggs are jammy. So I'll get that off. It's just fresh steamed rice. I've got some rice right out of the rice cooker. Great veggies on there. Crispy egg. Cooked it a little more than I would like it, but that is totally fine. Just kind of top that on there. That's the jammy you want right there. That's what I'm talking about. First bite of the day. That is so comforting, yet so light at the same time. This stir fry has changed the game for me. It's so unique in its preparation. You get these vegetables that are crispy and tender. And I think I'm just so used to throwing a bunch of vegetables in a wok, cooking them at high heat really fast, which gives you a different experience compared to what this is right here. All I can say is try it out. Let me know what you think in the comments because we're moving on. All right, so a lot of you have been asking about the wok that you've been seeing in these videos. This is from Hexclad and they are the sponsor of today's video. And to be honest, when I first saw Hexclad on the market, I was a little bit skeptical. And then I got a few pans in my kitchen and everything changed. Now you all know how overwhelming it can be to choose the right material for your cookware between nonstick, stainless steel, carbon steel, ceramic, cast iron. There's endless options. And from my experience, they all have their own pros and cons. And what's amazing about Hexclad is it's a hybrid of two of the best materials. You get all of the benefits of stainless steel with the heat retention and the maneuverability and durability, but you also get the nonstick side, that magical ease of use that every home cook loves. And the reason for that is the hexagonal technology you see in Hexclad pots and pans. You have raised stainless steel ridges, which create nonstick valleys that actually protect the nonstick coating from wearing away. And I was 
is very close to just completely ending my relationship with nonstick pants. No matter how good of a pan I would buy, they would wear out after like six months. And I hate throwing things out that should be lasting you a lifetime. And I've been using Hexclad pans every single day in my kitchen for the last year, and they still feel as fresh as they did when they came out of the box. So if you're looking to invest in some really high quality all-purpose cookware, click the link below. You can get 10% site-wide off your purchase, and we'll get back to some stir fries. Next up, we're headed over to Japan for some pork shogayaki, which comes in highly recommended from head culinary writer at Pro Home Cooks, Alex, who you might remember from past videos. She says this is by far her favorite just go-to stir fry to make. And from doing a bunch of research and really studying this dish, I totally understand why. The flavors are incredible. Actually, a lot of you have made the chicken teriyaki recipe from one of my most popular videos of all time on this channel. And these flavors are the exact same. It's teriyaki flavors just in a totally sort of different, unique form. So we got to do a little prep on this pork shoulder and we are going to start off with some aromatics. Number one, being the ginger. You can't skip ginger. It's in the name of the actual dish. But I'm also adding onion, which I think is an amazing pairing in this dish. And I'll peel the ginger and I'll take about a third of the onion and I'm just gonna run that through my microplane. You can use a grater or in these Japanese recipes, I see people using this sort of grating board like you would use on wasabi. I don't have one of those, but it's totally fine because the goal is to get some type of pulpy mixture like this. And a lot of times in traditional recipes, you separate the juice from the actual pulp or the fiber, but you don't need to do this step because the goal is just to get a ground up pulp like mixture, just like this. And I'll take that pork shoulder and slice it really thin against the grain, which is very important. We're trying to get this tough cut as tender as possible. And once our pork is cut thin, I'll take about a third of this ginger onion pulp. I'll pop that on the pork, plus about a tablespoon of soy sauce and a tablespoon of sake, which is both gonna flavor and tenderize the pork. And I'll mix that up and just let that sit for at least, I would say 30 minutes. But if you can get a few hours or even overnight, you're gonna have some flavorful tenderized pork. And then I'll move on to creating the sauce, which is really simple. I'll take the rest of that ginger onion paste along with the traditional Japanese teriyaki flavors, which you might know at this point. We've got soy sauce, mirin, and sake. And I'm gonna use them in equal parts. Two tablespoons of soy sauce, two tablespoons of mirin, two tablespoons of sake. And give that a mix and you've got your sauce. And this dish is pretty much prepped. So I'll get the wok going. It's really simple how it comes together. I've got the rest of this onion. So one third gone for the marination. The rest we will just slice up nice and thin. And I'm just doing some thin slices like that. And when my onion gets too thin to cut, I just flip it over and just rock right through it. So that's my onion. And then I have some extra Savoy cabbage. This is totally untraditional, but I like to stir fry some of this. A lot of times it's just served freshly sliced as a little side salad with this dish. But why not stir fry a little of the cabbage as well. We're gonna serve it both ways. And since this is hot, we'll start cooking the pork. I actually have a little bit of pork fat here. Great for searing, but use any type of oil you have. And I'll probably do this in two batches. I don't wanna overcrowd. Oh yeah. Pop that in. Two batches it is. Back to this cabbage. I'm gonna take a nice big chunk off, slicing right through it. Cabbage, just really going a long way in this dish. That's all she wrote. That's all the prep. We will turn over this pork. Getting a little bit of color there. You don't need much. That looks awesome. Turn it up. All right, that's the first batch done. Second batch going in. I'm just gonna do a quick little taste test on this pork. I was shocked the first time I made this. That tenderization from the sake, I don't know how it works, but it makes this pork shoulder so damn tender. It's like butter. All right, that's already done. And that pretty much sucked up all of that fat. You can see there's a little bit left. So I'll add just a little bit more. And then in with the onion. And the cabbage. And you really don't need any additional seasoning because we're dumping in this beautiful sauce and there's plenty of flavor there. Crank that heat. An hour stir frying. Now, how far you take these vegetables? It's up to you. And they're gonna soften once I pour the sauce in, which is gonna happen now. So we'll go in with that pork and then here we go to save the day. Oh, all that onion and ginger. Look at that. Oh my God, that cabbage just sucked 
up all of that sauce. It's gone. I don't even need to try that. <laughs> I lied to you. You do really need that additional stir frying of the sauce because one, it creates this beautiful glaze as you can see here, but it also lightly cooks those aromatics in the sauce, the ginger and the onion. You gotta sweeten them up. You gotta take off that edge. We're ready to serve. I'm gonna do a little bit of rice as well. Half rice, half cabbage. And then here we go. Wow. Do a little bit more. Oh. Stir fry heaven. I don't know why people don't stir fry the cabbage in this dish. Like how much raw cabbage do you really want to eat? Oh, by the way, if you don't have sake, which is not always the easiest thing to find, the best replacement seems to be white wine. That's what people say. Mm. This is everything you love about a stir fry mixed with everything you love about teriyaki sauce. Boom, one dish. I totally understand why this is Alex's go-to. It's not only delicious, but it's really simple to make. So for this last stir fry, we're headed over to China, which is the birthplace of the stir fry and a lot of these techniques and flavors. And honestly, I couldn't pick one recipe because there's thousands of them. It's very overwhelming with slight variations in techniques and ingredients. So what I did, what I thought would be helpful is crafting an all purpose stir fry sauce that you could use with whatever you have on hand, which is a great meal prep tactic. So really the goal here is to create a beautifully balanced sauce that it's gonna work with almost any meat or any vegetable. So I always start out with the umami salty flavors. We've got two tablespoons of oyster sauce, two tablespoons of soy sauce, and one tablespoon of miso, which is optional. You can also use one tablespoon of black bean paste as well. Then I move on to the acidic flavors. I've got two tablespoons of black vinegar and two tablespoons of Chinese cooking wine. Then to sweeten things up, I'm going in with one tablespoon of that fermented garlic honey, but you could use sugar or you could use regular honey or whatever sweet sweetener you want. Then to spice things up, I've got one tablespoon of chili paste. And then finally to add some body and thin it out a bit, I'm going in with four tablespoons of chicken stock. You can use another type of stock or broth or just use water. There's still gonna be plenty of flavor without the stock. And then finally, one tablespoon of cornstarch, which you see in a lot of Chinese stir fry recipes to create that nice thick glazed up sauce. Now, like I said, this sauce can work with everything. So what I did was headed out to the greenhouse, which is still bumping right now in December. I've got some beautiful bok choy growing in here. So I just picked a bunch of assorted bok choy leaves. And then on the way out, I also picked up a few green onions that have been frosted, but they're holding on for dear life. Now I was feeling something a little bit lighter. So I'm using tofu as the protein in this dish. And you wanna use some firm tofu and I'll slice it up and just dry it off a little bit and slice it up into cubes. And then I'll coat this in cornstarch, which will give it an extra crispiness. Cause what we're gonna do is air fry it, which is the easiest way to get delicious crispy tofu. Oil it up 400 degrees for about 12 minutes, hit it with a little bit of salt and you've got beautiful crispy tofu that's great in any stir fry. And then the only other real prep is chopping up some garlic and then slicing up that green onion. And I'll get my wok on a nice high heat. I'll add in some fat and I'll start frying off that garlic for about 30 seconds to infuse in the fat, throw in those onions and just stir fry the aromatics till they start smelling delicious and browning up a bit and then I'll throw in my bok choy and cook that for another few minutes. And when that's starting to stir fry nice, I'll toss in my crispy tofu chunks and then hit it with that sauce, which has that cornstarch in there. So you can see instantly that starts to thicken up and create a nice glaze. And if you need some more water to create some more sauce, toss that in there to create whatever type of consistency and sauciness you like. Stir fry three, tofu bok choy. Ooh, that bok choy really soaked up that sauce. Wow. With the cornstarch coating that has that orange chicken vibe, which is really nice, but different flavors. Again, I generally, as like a meal prep tactic, will just make a stir fry sauce because that single sauce will last me two stir fries, say throughout the week. Mm, so good. Three new stir fries. I am certainly inspired. Re-upped my game and hopefully it did the same for you. And if you want more videos like this, click the link right here.